State team here at Rocky Mountain College. And Brent Northup and I switch off hosting this tournament every year. It's a very nice, it's a, become a nice tradition to host this tournament for a few reasons. One of my favorite reasons to host this tournament is that we bring out Steve Yano, the
was incredibly influential at that time, and it still remains incredibly influential today. As people tend to think of, is debate a game, or is it something more than a game? Does it have transformative impact on people who participate in it? Is calling it a game uh, underselling it, or is calling it a game harming in some way? So there are three primary ways I think people think about debate. One is as a competition. One is as some kind of like corrective to wrong people. Like you don't understand the facts, I will hit you with the facts. Like it turns uh, facts and information into sort of weaponry. And you make people feel bad with it. Or it's a social event that's sort of fun. Uh, but if we're going to go with the game metaphor, I think there's probably no better uh, person to think about this than Gary Kasparov. I don't know if you know who Gary Kasparov is. There's a recent picture of him. Uh, he's, sort of, uh, he's sort of known now, you might know him as sort of an anti-Putin civil rights, free speech, human rights sort of advocate in Russia. He's Russian. Uh, and from a very young age, he was a chess player. His parents put him into the chess academy in the Soviet Union. And he was the world champion many, many times. And he's also, you might know him from having uh, been the first human to play a computer in chess. And uh, during the Deep Blue, they called this computer Deep Blue. It's a pretty good documentary about it. And uh, he played this computer and won some and lost some. To see the computer to be a human in chess. Um, Gary Kasparov wrote this, and it's something that I've talked about for years, and I think it's an interesting way to think about what it is that we're doing here this weekend and what it is that we're doing here uh, this season or maybe over the next couple of years. Chess, as a game, is very similar to debate because although it seems very simple to do, the complexity of it and the things it does for people are very complicated. So I'll read you some from his book that he wrote in 1980 about chess. I love chess even more for its versatility and many-sidedness. It was the beauty and brilliance of tactical blows that captivated me in early childhood. First, it was the admiration of this brilliance, then the search for it in my own games, and later, it was an attempt to play a beautiful game. These were the stages of my growth as a captive of the art of chess. I really like that one. I feel a captive of the art of debate. I don't feel like I can get out. I feel like, have you ever seen Godfather 3? It's sort of the way I feel my life in debate in a way. But as a captive of the art, it's sort of a weird way of putting it like it. Kasparov continues, I want to win. I want to beat everyone. But I want to do it in style. In an honest sporting battle. My parents taught me that the moves of the pieces when I was only five, and I was fascinated by them. One year later, I was taken to a chess group at the Young Pioneer Club in Baku, where I thought I'd found myself in a kingdom of chess players. Our instructor, in his desire to convince the novices of the paradoxical character of chess, set the following position on the board in one of our first problems. I don't know if you know anything about chess, but the thing that Kasparov is pointing at is how these three pawns are in control of the entire game. This position, where the small pawns were victorious over the enemy, was so surprising to me, it seemed like a fairy tale, and I was unable to live without chess after seeing I have admired this position ever since. I am convinced that it is necessary for both a grandmaster and an amateur who wants to improve his game and get some to get some pleasure from his play in tournaments. To achieve this high standard of play, the Grandmaster has spent thousands of hours studying hundreds of games. His talent would not develop without this amount of work. If you would like to play, but you do not have enough time for an independent study of it, but you still want to beat your friends, you will still have to spend dozens of hours over the board. I think Kasparov, I think this, I mean, I've always liked this, these couple of pages from his, uh, his first chess guide, this published I think, in 1980, 1982, because it really speaks to the kind of debate that I want to teach and the kind of debate I want to, where we've, we've encountered these moves, we've encountered it, and we want to do something more than just win. It's about the style of winning. It's about how we approach it. It's about what debate is for us. And his desire to play a beautiful game is sort of the way that I sort of introduce people to British parliamentary debate. It's playing a beautiful game. I think if we want to keep the 1916 idea of debate as primarily a game alive, uh, we need to think about it in terms of aesthetics. 
And we also might think about it in terms of affect. These are two incredibly popular terms in the study of rhetoric right now among scholars. When we start to think of debate this way, the possibilities become much greater than just reading the news or keeping up with Syria or things like that. It's like how can we interact and engage others in a way to where we, of course, win, we improve our chances of winning, but how can we improve a way to where we are admiring what we're doing, where we can say this is truly beautiful what we're doing. This is the question I think about a lot in my teaching of debate. And it's thanks to Kasparov that I started thinking about it. In my previous life, I was a policy debate person. I coached NDT and CETA. Anybody here from the NDT CETA tradition or policy debate? In, well, Sarah, yeah. But in, the, uh, in the, uh, the, the high school policy debate tradition, you can do that. Yeah. So there's a lot of crossover, and there's a lot of, of, of things that I think I was just having a discussion on Facebook with some friends of mine from policy debate. And someone was saying the most powerful thing that policy debate teaches that applies universally throughout, I don't know if I agree with this or not, so let me think about it, is the no link argument. The no link argument is the most powerful piece of argumentation you can be familiar with. It's useful everywhere, it's useful in everything, if you can make it and make it in a complicated way. We're not talking about just making it as a basic move, like, you know, moving the rook or moving the, the knight or moving the bishop, but moving these pieces in concert, and also in concert with the way the pieces are being moved by the other players. To do this, I think I'm going to talk about an orientation BP um, in terms of other, other games as well. So soccer, I think, is a good metaphor for how debate is often taught, which is that your job is to move something within a confined set of parameters, making sure you don't go out of bounds, making sure you get it into the goal. In fact, when I first started in BP, this is how judging was taught to me. They said they might not score a goal. But you want to look at which team moves the ball furthest and gets the total yardage or moves the ball furthest in terms of uh, persuasion. And I thought, well, that's pretty good. But the more I've gotten into BP, I find that this is a very limited metaphor of thinking about what your job is as a debater in a British parliamentary round. I don't think, I think we're too concerned about going out of bounds. I think we're too concerned about argument as a material object to be moved through the debate or claims or evidence or proof, whatever you want to call it rhetoric as a material force that we move through the debate with our word, words, or the point of the debate, and we're pushing it along, I think it's too material, I think it's too limited. And I also think that it makes us a little skittish about what we can do in a debate, and I think it kills our imagination as debaters. Uh, I suggest another metaphor, which is going to be weird, but hey, we all just watched the Olympics, right? Yeah, it was exciting, right? No? Okay, well. I was in Tokyo during the Olympics, and what the Japanese did was they had every channel was focused on a different sport. But what I found shocking as an American was it wasn't necessarily, it wasn't just about Japanese athletes. They had like one channel just doing judo all day and all night. So I'd come back to my hotel and just watch judo until I was It was endless judo. Like judo TV. It was the craziest thing. And I flipped the other channel, it was just ping pong. Endless ping pong. Like, it was like, you know, country had nothing to do with Japanese athletes. Next channel is just gymnastics. They're showing everybody doing the horse, just endlessly. I was like, this is the way to do the Olympics. This is pretty awesome. Instead of like, you know, five minutes of someone doing an event and then uh, Ryan Locke to interview. That's not how to, that's not how to show the Olympics in my opinion. Let's think about another metaphor. Think about this is a game that where the rules say where things are limited to be. Perform. I think we need to change that metaphor to something like Olympic diving. Where we think about the rules, or we think about the time limits as a platform upon which our performance is based. So instead of thinking about, I mean, the only thing you have to do is go into the water, right? And it depends on how big your splash is, you might lose points, things like that. So there's stylistic considerations, delivery considerations, as there are in the base. But the important thing is that the basis of the performance is not the limit. The basis is where one starts one's performance and tries to work within to do something incredibly creative, incredibly dynamic, incredibly impressive, on your way to the water, on your way. So the time limit is there too. Debates are finite. And in BP debate, one of the saddest restrictions is that you'll only speak once for seven minutes. There's no rebuttal. There's no, unless 
you think of like POIs as like instant rebuttal, like microwave rebuttal, which I think is a good way to think of POIs. Like, I can really go for some rebuttal right now, but you know, hey, two minutes, we're done. Bing, out it comes. Did you not listen to us when we said that all of your arguments were wrong? Uh, no, I did not. <laughs> Moving on with my speech, Mr. Speaker. I have seven points of crystallization I have to get to. Right I mean, that's kind of the soccer mentality, right? It's not necessarily the beautiful game. Think about it. The diver has total agency to add whatever twists and turns, however they want to get into the water, and that's what they're judged on. And I think this is a much, much more rich and imaginative and interesting way to think of debate as a game, as a scored game where your ability of sort of manipulating your time is up to you. Instead of soccer, where the material object must be moved into the goal without going out of bounds. Which is the way a lot of debate, unfortunately, that's much more of the pedagogical analog in a lot of the way debate is taught around the country. Uh, I see it all the time. I see it a lot. And I think, um, don't let the rules limit you. Use the rules as a platform upon which you base your dive into the arguments. Don't let the rules limit you. Don't think you'll, you will not be successful in BP. If you think about it as, if I make a mistake, I will lose. Or I would need to wait for them to make a mistake. And then I can get up and say, aha, aha, they said, you know, just like not the policy debaters always do. They said vote AF and they're in the neg. We just won the debate, yeah, oh yeah. And it's like they've been debating, they've been doing four debates. They're like completely out, having an out-of-body experience. They've only been living on skills and Sprite for two days. Like, you know, high school debate, right? High school debate, we all know about high school debate. That's what it's like. Um, and they don't know what side they are, they're just trying to win. They're like, vote F, Judge, and like, oh, we got them. Right? This kind of gotcha debate is the antithesis of British parliamentary debate. In fact, the trope that I think sums up policy debate and how different policy debate or CNDT debate is from me is the trope of when your partner or your coach or someone else on your team comes up to you and says, look at this argument, and you read it, and you smile, and you say, they'll have nothing to say. In BP debate, if they have nothing to say, you'll probably lose. Because it means you didn't offer anything that they could engage with. You were too small, you were too limited, you were too derivative. You will be rewarded for creating all kinds of generative points about the debate. Just like in diving, which is soccer, you'll be rewarded for the amount of twists, the amount of things you can do on your way into the water, into the depths of the argumentation. The more you can be creative, the more chances you have to be rewarded. I mean, you, can, you can screw up, of course. But that kind of a screw-up is different from the mentality of the soccer screw-up. And they screw up it's because they went really innovatively far. The soccer screw-up, they went out of bounds, they fouled, it's sort of a, they messed up. Gotcha debate isn't working for a British problem. All right, so he turns to think about British parliamentary debate is based on imagination. What can you come up with? What's the thing that you can do? Um, there are four teams in the debate. I'll kind of go over some of the basics now, so you have some questions for those of you who might be. Most of you seem familiar, so I'll go pretty quick. <coughs> four teams, two in favor of a motion, two against. They don't work together. The only person you work with is your partner. Each team has to use their imagination with the motion. Be like, what does this motion say that we can stand for, that we can advance, that we can advocate? Every team needs to have some kind of a thesis. Every team. You can't win as an opposition debater just by tearing up the government team. You can't do that. You say, oh, this was wrong, and that was wrong, and they didn't have enough evidence. So it doesn't work like that. This isn't an adversarial debate format. British parliamentary debate, for those of you who have taken game theory or international relations, is not a zero-sum game. It's not win-loss. It's ranked. That's a very, very different thing. So judges are looking for what you have advanced in the debate, what you have brought to the debate, what you have contributed to the debate, and it can't be that you pointed out all the flaws of the other people. You can, of course, do that, but that serves as a way to present contrast between the arguments they're advancing and yours, and why yours are stronger or better or more unique or advance the position of the debate. Every team needs to have a unique thesis to advance it. And you have to use your imagination. What is it we can say? So a lot of times, I mean, this is very empowering, but it's also very scary if you come from a debate history where you've been taught. There are these rules, and if you break them, you lose. In BP debate, it's perfectly acceptable to, be, to stand up in a debate and say, there are three 
criteria that the World Bank ought to use to determine if a country is financially stable. And they just make them up. I mean, we might not know if it, but if it's reasonable and it makes sense, then it's a good rubric. It's a debate about the normative. You get to suggest what those things would be, and if you can defend it, then do it. It doesn't necessarily matter if that's what actually happens, as long as you can defend it. You can create your own rubrics, create your own judgment criteria, or you can say, we feel, as the opposition team or the government team, that any country that does X ought to be punished in this way. Or any country that aligns itself with terrorism ought to be cut off from this and that benefit of the international community. And here's why. Just make it up. Use your imagination. You know, don't be conservative about it. Be developmental about it. You're advancing something. You're building something. That's the second point. This is a constructive model of debate. That means you are always building. That is, everything that you say, whether you're rebutting, refuting, POI, everything you say is pointing at the arguments that you have constructed and that you have advanced in the course of the debate. The judges are looking for reasons to endorse your position. They're not looking for last person standing in some kind of brawl. Like he's like, and I finally knocked out the last guy by breaking the pool cue. I think in like honky tonk bar brawls, my favorite move is when the guy breaks the pool cue across the back of somebody. I mean, you might have another favorite one, like when the guy smashes the bar, or when they throw the guy into all the alcohol behind the bar. There's all these tropes, right? Like, you know what a bar room brawl looks like. All these things have to happen for it to be a good one, I think. But um, I just kind of made that rubric up, right? So it doesn't exist anymore. But that's my favorite move is the breaking of the pool cue. So later on, if you see me in a bar fight, you'll see me trying to do that. It's not going to work very well. I'm not very strong. Um, if you're around buildings later tonight, just saying. It might happen. No, I'm just kidding. Um, constructing, building, advancing. Everything you do, even if you're one of the last two speakers in the debate, which are the summary speakers, or they're called the whip speakers, who are the final two speakers in the debate, this is a constructive speech. You're trying to sum up and show the judges why all of the arguments in the debate have led to you and your partner's position and why that position has moved the decision on your side, you know, the favorable side of the motion for your side of the house. That's what you do. It's constructive and it's based on something that you have imagined and created. And it's also an exercise in composition. A lot of times in other debate traditions, we're not interested in offering composition. What we're interested in doing is offering flaws, weaknesses, problems, problems with evidence, either in quality or quantity, problems in modes of proof, the warrants aren't well constructed, the claims are overblown compared to the warrant, right? Uniqueness overwhelms the link. We're pointing out problems and flaws, it's not composition. Composition means that you're taking everything that's happening in the debate and you're using it in a way to create arguments for your side. For example, our country, the United States, might not be your country, so I say our country, my country, possibly yours, the United States, is obsessed with shows about competitive cooking. <laughs> competitive cooking shows usually feature everyone being given similar or the same ingredients and then a giant pantry of resources upon which in 30 minutes they need to be able to cook something that's going to make these amazing restaurant owners weep with delight or rip their shirt open. And, I should have never run a restaurant and died to cook horrible food. I've never seen that happen, but um, if I produced the food show, this would happen frequently. But uh, the, um, the point is, is that this is sort of, I mean, first of all, um, making this comparison is sort of Plato's like, horror, horror show for me, but the comparison is that we are engaged in a cooking competition when we engage in this level of rhetoric and argumentation, which is, we've been given similar ingredients, how are we going to prepare those ingredients for the tastes of the judge? for the tastes of the judge. And who is the judge of a BP debate? Well, this isn't specialist argumentation. The judge in a BP debate is, well, it's changed over the years, but currently, on the international circuit, they say the average reasonable voter. Um, I like the idea of the average reasonable person, because there are plenty of average, reasonable, politically involved people who don't vote for valid and important political reasons, they don't participate in that process because they feel it undermines their politics, right? And it seems to be ignored on the international level when they talk about judge paradigm. But the average reasonable person is the paradigm that all judges are trying to go for. They're all trying to meet them. 
So that's the taste you're preparing for. Is this argument reasonable? Does it make sense to someone who pays attention to and cares about the world? Uh, is it something that a non-specialist would understand? Everyone in here has specialist knowledge, either from your life experiences or from something you've read that no one else has read, because you're weirdly obsessed with something. When I was an undergraduate, I was weirdly obsessed with Napoleon. I went and read every Napoleon book in the library. I tried to get into French, they wouldn't let me in. I mean, I was so disappointed. Like, all the French classes are full, man. you got to take another language. So I did German. I was like, I'll never use this. And now it's like, I'm always open. I'm always, like, I had to take somebody to the hospital. None of the doctors spoke English, so I spoke German. So it's helpful. But back in, in, in College Station, Texas, I didn't ever think my German would become useful when I graduated. But um, the, uh, the, 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 the point being that um, everyone's got expertise. Is that expertise something that people would have access to or not? Is there a reasonable expectation they would? Um, I think the, the bar for that has become pretty low in terms of international debating, that a lot of incredibly thick and incredibly deep and incredibly important ideas are, are, are coming across in debates. And even more so, uh, there are currents in the international debate scene of people um, accessing critical theory kind of arguments and the importance of those arguments to the debate community has trumped this somewhat archaic idea that that might not be expert information. So those things kind of become more palatable, to, use, to extend the cooking metaphor, to a larger group of judges who are actually quite interested in uh, critical and radical theories of identity and things like that. You're seeing more and more of that. So if you're comfortable with that kind of thing, I encourage you to imagine experiment. But remember, it's a composition. You have to realize that other people are using those same ingredients. You have to realize they're going to try to provide something to the judge's palate. And I think you can use what they're doing to highlight why yours is superior. This is very, very different than knocking out every logical or reasonable claim that the other side offers. Okay, so um, I'd like to get to your questions for a few minutes here before we have the demo clean. Uh, but I will say one more thing about points of information. There's no cross-examination in this form of debate. There's no uh, designated question time. The only thing that might happen is anyone from the opposite side of the house can rise to a point of information. That doesn't have to be a question. They can make an argument. They can rebut what you're saying. This is why I say it's instant insta rebuttal. <clears throat> so I'd say use POIs creatively. Use POIs as part of your um, strategy. Don't just think of them as ways to sort of repeat what you said. Use them as ways to point out how your arguments work with, compose with, how they interact with what's being said. A good POI is like a conversation heart. You know, you know conversation hearts? Is this still a thing? I love them. Like, I don't even read them anymore. I go buy a bag of them like on February 15th and just kind of eat them. A handful, they're really good. Little, little blobs of sugar that say things like, be mine, or love you, or bite me. I guess they don't say that. They say they can come, come over later. I don't know. Netflix and chill. I don't know what they say. They probably say modern things like text me, don't call me or I'll hate you forever. A phone is not for the ear and the voice. A phone is a telegraph machine. These are some weird conversation words. Anyway, a good POI is like a conversation part. It's small. It's to the point. Be mine. And it's sweet. George W. Bush, our illustrious former president, I'm sure you remember that guy, he's hanging out in Dallas nowadays. George W. Bush, our illustrious former president, was once interviewed about presidential debates, and Jim Blair asked him, how do you win a presidential debate? And George W. Bush said, well, I don't think you can win them, but you sure can lose them. He said, well then, Mr. President, how do you prepare not to lose them? He's like, you got to have a lot of zingers. And he's like, what is a zinger? He's like, you know, zingers, like little points like zingers, like... <laughs> and I thought about that and I was like, you know what George W. Bush is talking about? He's talking about POIs. They, there's an old British adage in BP debate that no one's ever won or lost a debate on a POI. But what a POI does, I think, is even more powerful. It shines lights on parts of your argumentation that may have been missed 20 or 30 minutes after a judge has heard them. It helps the lighting, I mean, the scene has been performed. I'm on a stage, so I can use a theater. The scene's been performed, everything's happening, but the light can be shine, shown in a way 
that would highlight things that might not have been there on the first pass. So they're incredibly powerful. Don't discount them. And don't think of them as simply questions. If your POI is taken, you have 20 seconds to do whatever you want. Rebuttal. This is your rebuttal, I think. Especially on the short and long diagonal, which in top rooms at big major international tournaments, long diagonal decisions are very, very frequent. I don't think anyone's done the math on that. or the, the It would be good to do the stats on that and do some, some kind of an academic paper on that, I think. But um, I think long diagonal decisions are tough because if you get to lay out rounds at Yale or at Oxford or Cambridge or any other big IV, Hart House or something like that, you're going to find people saying, well, it's between opening government and closing up. And those two teams never directly engage unless you use the POIs to do so. So, think about that. Those are like tie-breaking kind of things. So, no one's ever won or lost in a POI? Okay, I'll grant that. But it sure does help shine the light where you want the judges to look at your argumentation the closest. Your questions. I tried to be quick. I like to talk. Question anything about BP at all. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Yeah. Should you use POIs to construct your own case or to point out different, like, potential flaws in your opponent's arguments? I, I think you could, I'm going to say it depends for a lot of these questions, but I think, yeah, I think you could do that, but I would, I would caution you, especially over here, I'm closing out about doing that. You see people do this all the time, where they'll ask a POI to open a dove, and they'll say, what about this? And they kind of flag their line, and then uh, the deputy opposition leader is like, here's our extension point, yoink, <laughs> right? So that's bad. But this can also be used in terms of a red herring fallacy, which you might know from speech or argument, uh, argument class, where you can get up and flag a point that you're not going to talk about that you actually think is a losing argument, make it sound like it's going to be your extension. Then they take it, they're stuck with a losing argument, and you go in a completely different direction. You do that as well, too, as far as advanced tricks for your top half if you're down here. I think if you're up here and you want to make the debate more engaging, you can start to kind of flag what you're is opening up, you can kind of flag what you're going to argue if they take your POI. But it also you can generate arguments, you can ask questions, you can try to, to do whatever it is that you think is going to help get your arguments uh, an, an upper hand. So you talk a lot about um, really being constructive rather than just like refuting certain points and that inner debater and a lot of that is just want to say like when they say this, this is completely wrong. Would, can you give an example of like a time that you would be able to Respond to something that somebody's brought up while still offering a constructive response? Yeah, I mean, that's, I, I wish I could think of a good example, but some of the best debates I've seen are where, so what I don't want you to do is I don't, I don't think it's good, I don't think you're going to be in the upper echelons of debate if you get up and you say, I'm going to start with rebuttal and then I'm going to go into my own points. I'm like, well, it's a debate tournament. I kind of know you're going to do this. And it's also a division that harms the constructive ability of you to offer creative, engaged, human-oriented arguments. So why not develop a speech? I mean, especially as a deputy, which we all think of, deputy prime minister or deputy opposition leader, this second speech here, which people think of as kind of an attack not speech or a reputation kind of speech, especially here, which is the last time you're going to be heard for a long time, especially if you're opening up, as a speech where you're developing the case and then when it comes time to shine some contrast, to bring some contrast, and say, let's look at what opposition says on this issue. They've completely missed the boat. They've missed it completely. They don't have any, they don't understand it at all. All their examples, I mean, this is where you can tear them apart. You can do that refuty thing there. What I want to warn you about is doing sort of this, I'm going to refute now, and now I'm going to construct. Because I think, it, I think it, it really does hamstring in a way. To where I want you to think about this as a, uh, create, you're crafting something. And it has to be sort of compositional, and it has to be uh, something palatable, and it has to be something the judges can do something with. And it's frightening to, I think, go outside the box, because I don't think there's any VP tournament I'm going to go to where I'm not going to have to put up with this nonsense of, um, surprise, I'm going to refute, surprise, I'm going to construct. I mean, where, do you, where are we? It's not like I'm at the car show, and you grab me, and you're like, if you grab me and started refuting an argument at the car show, I'm going to be like, whoa, whoa, wait, who are you? What's going on? But I mean, the context is well established for that. I don't get it. I think it's good to be, I think, a little bit more creative. I think it's good to be a little bit more, I mean, remember, your judges are listening to stuff all day. 
if you can really wow them. And also remember the psychology of human beings. Have you ever been in a situation where a person asked you to do something for them, and you did it exactly right, and they were like, you don't understand me. I hate you. Why did you do this to me? This is kind of how it is. The judges say we want these things, and then, but they don't really know what they want. I mean, the speech that's going to wow them is the one that's going to kind of violate the norm in certain ways. You don't, I mean, I'm not talking performance art here. Don't light a fire and say no bongos or anything like that. But I do think that there needs to be this uh, a rhetorical consideration for the speech. It's a deep rhetorical consideration. Not just like introduction, main body, conclusion, rhetorical consideration, but a deep rhetorical consideration. This is interactive and human. That's what I think is missing from contemporary debate. And when you get to those, you know, when you watch those really high rooms, you kind of see this coming out in terms of the use of pauses, the use of passion, things that you don't see in those rooms that are two or three points on the bubble, right? Those ones that are, you don't see that so much. At least I don't. But I don't watch a lot of debates. I, I, I peep them and I don't watch them. But when I was watching a lot of debates, I saw this and it was like, you know, it was really kind of a big transitional point between those top two rooms and everything else. So, good question, though. On the end, you and uh, As the deputy, how much should you um, focus on like reinforcing the arguments of like the primary of the LO versus bringing up actual new matter? Should it be balanced? The, the traditional answer is going to be about, you know, you want to spend a couple of minutes on your extension point, at least. But I think that's sort of a paradigm where you're kind of speaking quickly and you're doing a lot of line-by-line -line stuff and all that, which is becoming more and more popular. I would say think of it like this. Think of it as getting up after they've made their case and their line. Now you have a lot of material work. They've made their thesis. they made their line. Here's why we're opposition. Here's what we think. You have to engage with that. One of the best ways to engage with it is to reinforce the ideas that your partner brought up. So, well, here's what we stand for. Here's what we're about. Here's what we are talking about today. Here are the things that they didn't talk about at all. We offered you these three points. They didn't mention anything about this argument or this argument. What they focused on was this, and then you can sort of get into the, into the refutation. Um, but the traditional answer would be a couple of minutes of the extension point. You say, okay, now, extension point, here we go. But I think that we're selling ourselves short in our ability to be persuasive and our ability to really um, win, I think, and win Kasparov sort of way. I want to win, I want to beat everyone, but I want to do it in a beautiful way. So this is sort of um, taking control of your event. Are you going to follow along with what everyone else did? I mean, here's the, here's the big contradiction about debate. Debate is a rhetoric game. It's a situational game. The arguments that work in one situation might not work in another one. Evidence and facts change every day. Information changes every day. Um, you can be abreast. I mean, even if you got intelligence briefings, things would be changed all the time, um, which would be a cool thing to get as a debater. Wouldn't it be cool if you got an intelligence briefing every morning? You'd be like, I'm going to win everything. But, um, what we would do, even in that situation, is we try to replicate what people did two years ago at Oxford to win, or what they did in the World's Finals to win. Right? And it's like, we're, we, we think we, if we copy something that was tailored for a situation where there's a feeling in the air, you, you can't say you have to help this. Certain debates, there's a feeling of what you should do. And if you follow that feeling, things work out sometimes. It may take some skill and practice, too, to be able to insert yourself in a debate. But um, we try to replicate things that are situationally based. And those arguments and speeches were awesome because they were attuned to the situation that they were in. We try to copy these things. It's not really going to get you very far. So I think that trying to be a bit creative and a bit um, uh, trying to work and weave these things together is way too approach that. So you had a question. Can you speak to the importance of modeling in a piano speech? Yeah. I think modeling is not planning. Some traditions of debate have planning. Don't, I don't think of it like that. Modeling helps direct the debate to the example that you think is sort of the uh, either synecdoche or an autonomy for the entire debate. So the classic example when people talk about modeling is immigration. You know, uh, this house believes that a incredibly strict immigration policy is preferable when dealing with refugees or something like that. Now this requires a model, I think, to have it. Because you can't just do generic terms to talk about this. You'd be like, our model would be that um, in the case of the migrants in the EU, this is what should happen. And you want to be specific enough to where you can ground the debate on the principles you want to have. It's not that you're offering a plan that's going to solve the problem. It's that you're offering a model to clarify how these principles look in practice to generate arguments about, well, what, why would this be a bad idea? 
Not necessarily it wouldn't work. I don't think people went on, um, on that. It has to be that in principle we wouldn't do it. Because a lot of times you'll see younger debaters be like, well, this is going to be incredibly expensive. And the government team's like, yeah. Yeah. Justice is expensive. Doing good in the world is expensive. We're happy to pay for it. It's fine. <laughs> no worries. Right? And this baffles younger debaters. It's like, oh my God. They just like conceded my entire spending this ad. I'm going to win the debate. Well, I mean, it might not be a big thing when you're debating sort of on a principled level. What is the, no, like it's normative debate. It's debating on this principled level. It's competitive cooking. It's not as if it's like, well, that's going to be expensive food to make. And the judge is like, well, you want to know something that's really going to blow our palate away, right? You don't think about that in a competitive cooking show, right? So modeling helps you angle the debate around the principles you want. It doesn't allow the opposition to kind of take control of that, which they would if you didn't model. You don't necessarily have to have a model, but it helps you access the principles in practice. So when we talk about integration, if you did something like, um, I don't know, somebody you're like, we think the best idea would be to build a wall between Mexico and the United States, and that's going to be our model. So if you wanted to run that, then that would focus it around principles that you would want to, it, it becomes an example of what it is in practice you want to do, and then it helps the other teams access arguments to clash with them. I think that really helps the quality of the arguments. So you, you mentioned that you don't like it when people say I'm going to repeat now and then construct. Do you think there is an importance, however, in mode mapping? And so what would be the proper way to do this? I mean, I think that I think that, that kind of I mean, sure, there's a lot of people who expect you to do that. I just wonder if anybody would be like, well, you didn't tell me when you're refuting so you lose. I don't I mean, I don't know if that happens. What I'm telling you to do is prioritize a creative approach and a sort of stylistic compositional approach to debate rather than an approach of I'm following the rules extremely well. Like, I mean, in class this might happen where you've done everything on the paper exactly as the professor said you got to see. Like, well, I did everything you asked, how come I didn't get an A? And like, well, you, you know, it wasn't really there. The quality, you know, it's quality. Is, if, you, if you want to learn about quality, you can read this book, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. It's all about what quality is. Investigation of quality. A discourse about quality, whatever. It's investigation of quality is so tough. This is a fantastic book about how slippery that is and how scared we are of it. So these kind of things become handholds, I think, for poorer judges to give reasons why they rank people lower or not instead of going. It's like, I was really moved by that, or that really, that really got me, that was really exciting, or wow, that was really passionate, that was really cool, way to do argument, sort of the emotional or emotive, um, uh, uh, affective elements of debate. Um, I think if you want to do that, that's fine. I'm just saying don't think that that's the only thing you can do, and don't think you have to do that. Just because everyone else is doing it, I mean, this, now I sound like your dad, just because everyone else is doing it doesn't mean you have to do it. But, you want to think about these things as small strategy, and ways of engaging and making the debate more exciting, more engaging, more something that they can more um, uh, grasp hold of, so that you can help yourself win better. Playing a beautiful game. I'm just doing everything else, I mean, like that's what I'm saying, it's like, Early on, I loved taking pieces of bashing people with cool moves I'd learned. I really liked that. But after a while, they got boring. And I wanted to win, but I wanted to do it in a way that had a, sort of, a certain aesthetic quality to it that he identifies as the beautiful. Uh, it could be a number of things, I think. When you look at aesthetic theory, you find it could be a number of things. But, um, uh, I mean, it's a good question because I don't want you to say, I certainly don't want you to take what I'm saying. Say, I said it was wrong and it was bad to do. There's a certain aesthetic quality to that, too. And there's a certain set of quality to um, speaking like that. But it's not the only one. But knowing it has aesthetic resonance with the audience with judges, and that other ways of speaking would too, is an important thing to realize and understand. It's not a container. It's a part of the argument. It's not a... You know, signposting is a part of the drive. It's not outside of it. I mean, you can signpost other ways. I mean, it's pretty obvious when you're like, the arguments that they made, let's look at them. Da, 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 as you're building your speech, as you're giving a more uh, normal, natural, sort of human, not natural, but a normal, sort of broader audience, average, reasonable person kind of speech, and not debate expert speech. I think a lot of times we're sort of folding in the average, reasonable person into the expert in tournament debate. I think that's a big problem that eventually will catch us. Not anytime soon. You guys are okay. Brent. How does, a judge, how does the judge mind of Steve work? We said, I mean, these are rubrics for debate. Yeah. Well, sure. when you're listening to a round or when you start the adjudication, 
what's the first go-to thought you have in trying to sort out one that room? Mm. Well, it's different every time. Usually there's a team that I think really excelled in performance. There's usually one where I'm like, okay, they're, they're one at the top. Because their argument was awesome. It was something that often I didn't really think about, but they explained it really well. I was like, yeah, they really nailed it. A lot of times in a debate, it's the thing that we kind of know what's going to happen, but it's the thing we didn't think about that it's like. Or we thought about it a little, we're like, yeah, that was really important. But it's often a rib shot or a bank shot off of other things people are saying. It's always in combination. So normally, what I do is I rank the debate in my mind, I'm like, well, that was really good. And that was almost as good, but it's close. And through the conversation, you find ways and you construct rubrics for ways of differentiating teams. And usually it's things like, well, they were a little bit deeper in their analysis, or they kind of left out a key example, or they didn't talk about this. Usually it's things like that. But some judges are, are a lot more precise than I am. A lot more precise. I've been on panels with people who are like, ooh, like really, really into it. And then you're on some, on some panels where people are like, well, they only spoke for six minutes and 40 seconds, so they can't possibly win. And I'm like, where, where are you from? <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah. It's your first day on Earth. Like, why should that be a consideration? It's about, I mean, argument quality is what judges want. What that is would take a very long time to discuss with you. I mean, there's a 2,500 year long tradition of discussing what makes a quality argument. Uh, and it really, I mean, it's really cutting edge, too. And I think we'll leave it at that because I think we've got to start the debate. Have you seen it right, Shelby? I don't want to monopolize all the time. But I think that I'll leave you with this thought. In the field of artificial intelligence, the Turing test, sort of dismissed, the new Turing test, is can an AI um, engage in a sustained argument with a human? If a program can do that, you have AI. It's the new litmus. So that makes what we're doing here incredibly cool in science fiction, right? So the AI people come to the rhetoric and argumentation people of philosophers today are going to like, we have a new Turing test, this is great. Uh, just give us a great model of argument and we'll go back to work. And we're like, we're still working on it. How long have you been working on it? 2,800 years. <laughs> like, no one can really agree. What's a good model of art? Everyone disagrees. Everyone argues about this. How do you know? I mean, everybody here knows the Toolman model. Like, every debater in the world knows the Toolman model. What's your warrant? Warrant is bad. What's the warrant? You know? uh, everyone talks about that one aspect of the Toolman model. But there are other models of argumentation, too, that have advantages to Spanish, too. Toolman's been heavily, heavily critiqued by this, even when he came out, and even today, by philosophers, by rhetoric, and others. It's not the only model in existence for judging or evaluating an argument. Saying what a good argument is, making that kind of claim. So um, there might also be something to argument as a field where it defies that kind of model. I mean, we can go back to sort of the sophist. You know, like a good argument is the one that persuades the audience that you're talking to. That seems like a pretty good one to me. But then a lot of people are like, well, there's ethical problems with that. The sophist would say, if the audience thinks so. And so off you go, off to the races, off to the story of Western philosophy starts there. Well, I hope this was helpful. Oftentimes I lecture and I feel like I, I only cause problems and questions. Uh, but also that's, that's another definition of success, isn't it? So I'm happy to talk to you about all these ideas. I hope that in the tournament rounds, in this debate, we see some of the things I'm talking about. And I hope that you try some things out. Remember, Olympic diving, not soccer. Don't worry about going outside the bounds. Do your flip, do something like that. If you make too big of a splash, um, well, you can always correct it sort of next time. So think about that. Think about the beautiful game. Uh, I'm around if you want to ask questions while they set up. So thanks so much for your attention.